today is yeah, the 12th of July 2009. Yeah. We are starting on the Sangyuta Nikaya Suttas. Yeah. And uh, you see how many suttas we can complete in these three months, Vasa. Hopefully, we can cover most of the suttas. But uh, I will try to speak on these suttas every night. But the uh, problem is, you know, when you talk one hour of the suttas, uh, you need a few hours of preparation. So I don't know whether every day uh, can prepare or not. Last time when I did the Anguttara Nikaya, it was like one talk a week. Uh. So I had one week to prepare and now I have only uh, a few hours every day. Uh to prepare. Mm. So anyway, we will try our best. Huh? This uh, Sangyuta Nikaya is one of five uh, Nikayas. Huh? Uh, Nikayas means collections of the Buddha's discourses. Huh? And uh, Sangyuta means yoke together or group together. Huh? So, Sangyuta Nikaya can, can be said to be uh, topically group discourses. Now, all the, the five Nikayas, uh, the Diga Nikaya, Majima Nikaya, Sangyuta Nikaya, Anguttara, and Pudaka Nikaya. Diga Nikaya are the long discourses of the Buddha. 34 suttas, uh, long discourses. Majima Nikaya are the middle length discourses of the Buddha. There are 152 discourses. Uh, the Sangyuta Nikaya consists of about 2,000 discourses of the Buddha and they are short discourses. Uh, most of them are short discourses. Uh. Similarly, the Anguttara Nikaya are short discourses, uh, about 2,000 uh, of them. Uh. And the Kudaka Nikaya is a collection of uh, Discourses uh, that were compiled later. Uh, it's called Kuda Kudaka means minor collection. Uh, but over the years, uh, it has grown uh, with the addition of more and more books uh, until it has become the major collection. Uh. The Sangyuta Nikaya is sometimes said to be the oldest of the Nikayas and the most important. Uh, why is it the most important? Because the Buddha's teachings uh, are concerned with enlightenment or uh, liberation and actually there's only one path to liberation the Noble Eightfold Path taught by the Buddha now this Noble Eightfold Path if it, if it is expanded uh, can be said to be the 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas Bodhi Pakya Dhammas means the requisites of enlightenment and the Buddha has st stated uh, in several discourses uh, that the core of his teachings uh, are found in these uh, 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh, the essence of his teachings, uh, the most important part of his teachings. Uh. What are these 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas? First you have the four right efforts, uh, Samapadana, then the four intense states of recollection, Satipatthana, the four bases of psychic power, Idipada, the five faculties, uh, Indriya, the five powers, Bala, the seven factors of enlightenment, Bojanga, and the noble eightfold path, Arya, Atangikam, Maga. So these uh, numbers, uh, if you add them up together, they become 37. That's why they are called uh, 37 Bodhi Bhakya Dhammas. Uh, unlike the Diga Nikaya and the Majima Nikaya, the suttas in the Sangyuta Nikaya do not have a proper name uh, agreed by everyone. Uh, so sometimes the names given are differ. Now the Sangyuta Nikaya is divided into five books or five vagas. Uh, and these vagas, uh, books, uh, are divided into chapters uh, called Sangyutas. Uh, and there's a total of 56 Sangyutas uh, in the five books uh, or the five vagas. Uh. And these Sangyutas uh, are the main topics in the Sangyuta Nikaya. Now, 
all the suttas within a sangyutta, and there are 56 of them, uh, all the suttas in one sangyutta concern the same topic. Lah. For example, the first one, Devata Sangyutta, all the suttas there are compiled, uh, they have something to do with Devata. Uh, and then, for example, the 47th Sangyutta is the Satipatthana Sangyutta. And this Satipatthana Sangyutta, all, all the suttas in this uh, Satipatthana Sangyutta have to do with Satipatthana. Uh, the Satipatthana groups together uh, all the discourses uh, of one particular topic. Uh, that is why a, a good translation of Sangyutta Nikaya is uh, topically grouped discourses. Uh. At the moment, there are two translations in English uh, of the Sangyutta Nikaya. The first one was by the Pali Text Society, and this one is about a hundred years old already. Uh. And because it was the first translation, uh, it was not uh, very well done, uh, not very accurate. Uh, but considering at that time it was the best. Uh, because now over the last 100 years, uh, the understanding of the Dhamma has grown uh, among English-speaking uh, people. Uh, and so now the most recent translation and the best we have now is by Wisdom Publication, uh, by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, an American uh, among uh, and this was done in the year 2000. So if you order this book, you have to get it from Wisdom Publications. Now, so we will use the uh, translation of Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, in these talks. Uh, because it's the best translation we have uh, at the moment. I will read the suttas. Uh, I might not read all the suttas. Uh, I will try to read as many suttas as possible, or parts of them, and then explain as best as I can. Okay, now we come to the first uh, Sangyutta, or the first book first. We come to the first book, uh, it's called the Sagata Vaga. And according to the introduction uh, in this book, uh, the Sagata Vaga is so called because all the suttas in this book contain verses. Verses meaning gata, uh, at least one, uh, usually more. The Vaga is divided, or the book uh, is divided into 11 Sangyutas containing a total of 271 Suttas. Lah. Most of these Sangyutas are subdivided into several sections, lah, usually of 10 Suttas each. Lah. In the Pali Text Society copy of this uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, when they refer to the Suttas, uh, they also refer to these uh, sections. Lah. But for this suttas that I'm going to read, uh, I will not refer to the sections. Uh, I will only refer to the sutta number uh, in that sangyutta. For example, if I say uh, sutta number 25.49, uh, that means it is the 25th sangyutta uh, in this sangyutta nikaya, 25th chapter. Uh, and uh, 49 sutta la, in, in that sangyutta. La, uh, so bear in mind uh, uh, that uh, the sutta numbers uh, will be, the first number will be the sangyutta number, the second number will be the sutta number uh, in that whole sangyutta. La. Now we come to the first uh, sangyutta, the Devata sangyutta. Uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi explains here, uh, Devata is an extract noun uh, based on Deva. But in the Nikayas, it is invariably used to denote particular celestial beings. This is the English word deity. Originally an ex abstract noun, meaning the divine nature, is normally used to denote the supreme god of theistic religion, religions or an, or an individual god or goddess of polytheistic faiths. Though the word is feminine, the gender comes from the abstract suffix star and does not necessarily mean the devatas are female. The text rarely indicate their sex, though it seems they can be of either sex and sometimes perhaps beyond sexual differentiation. Okay, so now we will go into the first sutta. 
the first sutta. So the sutta number is 1.1. The title here is uh, Crossing the Flood. Thus have I heard. Uh, this uh, translation, thus have I heard, uh, the Pali is Evame Sutang. Like when we chant the Mangala Sutta, we always start with Evame Sutang. And in Chinese, it, the meaning is Wu Si Wo Wen. Thus have I heard. This uh, phrase, uh, the Buddha advised the monks to use uh, whenever they uh, quote a sutta. Hmm? That means they have heard it from the Buddha. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling in Savati, in Jeta's grove, Anatta Pindika's path. Then when the night had advanced, a certain Devata of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire Jeta's grove, approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One, stood to one side and said to him, How, dear sir, did you cross the flood? And the Buddha said, By not halting, friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. Again he asked, But how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you cross the flood? And the Buddha said, When I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. But when I struggled, then I got swept away. It is in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. And the Devata said, After a long time at last, I see a Brahmin who is fully quenched, who by not halting, not straining, has crossed over attachment to the world. This is what the Devata said. The teacher approved. Then that Devata, thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping him on the right, disappeared right there. Now, that's the end of the Sutta. Now, this Deva asked the question, how did you cross the flood? This flood, crossing the flood, means going over to the other shore. Sometimes they use this expression. And it means becoming liberated. This shore is Sangsara, the mundane world, which is the cycle of birth and death. La. And the other shore is Nibbana. La. To cross over to the other shore also means cross the flood. La. And the Buddha said, la, by not halting and by not straining. Another translation you can use la, is by not, not standing still and not striving hard across the flood. La. And then he asked, how is it la, by not standing still and not striving hard? La. The Buddha said, when I came to a standstill or when I stood still, then I sang. But when I strove hard, then I got whirled about. This is another translation. I got whirled about. It is in this way, friend, that by not standing still and by not, and not striving hard, I crossed the flood. What the Buddha means is that he practiced a middle path. In the beginning, when the Buddha used effort to struggle, to seek liberation, uh, he used excessive effort. Uh, and he used excessive effort uh, to the extent that he underwent various types of uh, ascetic practices, uh, extreme ascetic practices, uh, by going naked. He said uh, when he was practicing uh, the ways of the naked ascetic, uh, uh, in the daytime uh, he will be scorched by the sun. Because uh, uh, India, uh, sometimes daytime is extremely hot. Uh, be burned by the sun. And at night, uh, when the cold wind blows from the Himalaya mountains, uh, he will be shivering so much that his teeth will be chattering. <laughs> so that was uh, one extreme. Uh. And then another kind of extreme was like he ate little. Uh, he practiced like uh, eating one meal a day. Then later, two days, one meal. And then uh, later, three days, one meal. And then four days, one meal. Uh, until, I think, 14 days, uh, he only took one meal. Uh. Of course, when he took that one meal, he will gorge himself uh, as much as he could. Uh. And then after that, he uh, refuses to eat for 13 days. Uh. When he tried this type of practice, uh, and he found uh, that it, will, it did not bring him enlightenment, uh, then he abandoned it. Uh. Then he tried something else. Uh. And he tried like eating less, every, eat every day, but eat less. Uh and eat less and less and less until uh, he ate one grain of rice a day, uh, nothing else. Uh. 
one grain of rice a day because his desire to become liberated was so strong. Explanation of the Noble Eightfold Path, how they said, or the Four Noble Truths, it is said that the cause of suffering, dukkha, is craving, and one of the cravings is craving for existence and craving for non-existence. So in this case, uh, he's craving for non-existence, uh, that means to be liberated from this world, uh, was excessive. Uh, so uh, it is a, a cause uh, for continued existence, uh, because uh, if a person uses too much effort, uh, then he is not cool. Uh, and Nibbana is a state, uh, a cool state. Uh, so to reach Nibbana, uh, the, the cultivator uh, has, has got to be cool. Uh, so when you use too much effort, you uh, the mind is very agitated. Uh, the desire uh, is too strong. That's why he said uh, when he used when he strove too hard, uh, he got whirled about. Uh, whirled about. It's, just, it's like uh, in a in a whirlpool. Uh, you know. And but when he uh, did not use any effort at all, uh, then he sang. Uh, so without these two extremes uh, of no effort and too much effort, uh, he practice the middle way. La. That means the path to liberation la, is by making effort, but not to have too much desire. La. It's always said la, that uh, that when we practice the holy path, la, we make the effort, but don't be too ambitious la, for the result. La. The result will come naturally la, when we practice the right way and we let go, la. let go of our attachments. La which includes, of course, the desire to be liberated. Now the second sutta, at Savati. When the night had advanced, a certain devata of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire jata's grove, approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One, stood to one side and said to him, Do you know, dear sir, emancipation, release, seclusion for beings? And the Buddha said, I know, friend, emancipation, release, seclusion for beings. But in what way, dear sir, do you know emancipation, release, seclusion for beings? And the Buddha said, by the utter destruction of delight in existence, by the extinction of perception and consciousness, by the cessation and appeasement of feelings, it is thus, friend, that I know for beings, emancipation, release, seclusion. So here the Deva is asking the Buddha whether the Buddha knows the path to emancipation or liberation. And the Buddha says he knows. And the Deva asks him to explain. And the Buddha said, first the utter destruction of delight in existence. Means, but for you to achieve that, you've got to see Dukkha in existence. If you realize uh, that existence is dukkha, suffering, uh, unsatisfactory, uh, that is one condition. Uh, and then the other one, the Buddha said, uh, extinction of perception and consciousness, and cessation and appeasement of feelings. Uh. Uh, normally in the suttas, the Buddha talks about a state, uh, niroda, cessation, uh, which also means a cessation of perception and feeling. Uh. But when there is cessation of perception and feeling, uh, it also means cessation of consciousness. Uh, because all these come together. Uh, if a person can come to that state uh, where consciousness, perception and feeling ceases, uh, then that is liberation. Because this world uh, is the world of the six consciousness. Uh, and our six consciousness, uh, the seeing consciousness, the hearing, smelling, taste, touch, and thinking consciousness arises, uh, then the world arises. Uh. So Nibbana is a state uh, uh, where consciousness ceases, uh, and together with it, uh, feeling and perception, so that the world ceases entirely. Uh. The third sutta, 1.3, uh, at Savati, standing to one side, the Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Life is swept along, short is the lifespan. No shelters exist for one who has reached old age. 
seeing clearly this danger in death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. And the Buddha said, Life is swept along, short is the lifespan. No shelters exist for one who has reached old age. Seeing clearly this danger in death, a seeker of peace should drop the world's bed. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Deva recited four verses. And the Buddha, in reply, the first three verses, the Buddha copied him. But the last one, the Buddha said, a seeker of peace should drop the world's bed. Whereas the Deva said, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. This Deva is saying uh, that life, uh, there's no security in life uh, because all of us uh, is swept along the stream of life uh, and we grow old, we become sick and we die. Uh, uh. So he said, uh, seeing this danger uh, that we have to die, uh, that we should do deeds of merit uh, and bring us to a good rebirth, uh, bring us to a happy state of rebirth. Uh. But the Buddha said, uh, if you can see uh, that life is such uh, that in every state uh, of rebirth, uh, you have to grow old, you have to become sick and die, uh, then uh, a real seeker of peace, that means permanent peace, uh, should drop the world's bait. The world's bait means uh, all the worldly pleasures uh, that entice us uh, to prolong our existence. Uh. We want to exist in this world uh, because there is happiness in this world. Uh. If there is no happiness, nobody would want to live in this world. But at the same time that there is happiness, uh, there is also suffering in this world. So because there is suffering, that is the reason why we want to seek for liberation uh, out of existence. Uh. But happiness and suffering uh, is such uh, that However much happiness you experience uh, is never going to be enough. Uh. You are never going to be satisfied. Uh. Whereas when we experience dukkha, suffering, uh, even a little bit, uh, we find it so hard to stand, uh, to bear, uh, we can't tolerate it. Uh. So because of that, uh, that's why we seek liberation. Uh. And as we grow, to life, uh, as we go through the round of rebirths, uh, we become more spiritually mature uh, until we one day, uh, because of so much suffering, uh, that one day we look for a way out of samsara, out of this round of rebirths. The fourth sutta, 1.4, at Savati also, standing to one side that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Time flies by, time flies by, the night swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger in death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. And the Buddha said, time flies by, the night swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger in death, a seeker of peace should drop the world's bay. So here again, uh, the Buddha replied to this Deva by imitating, uh, copying the first three verses. Uh, and then the last one, the Buddha, Buddha says something different. Uh. You find these Devas, uh, they encourage people to do deeds of merit for the very simple reason uh, that in the previous life, uh, they did a lot of merit, uh, meritorious deeds. Uh, that's why uh, they were reborn in heaven. Uh. So when they were reborn in heaven, they were experienced so much bliss and happiness. Uh. That's why they think uh, that's the best way, uh, that everybody should do deeds of merit uh, and be reborn in heaven. Uh. But the Buddha, uh, with the higher wisdom, uh, sees uh, that even this uh, happiness in heaven uh, is impermanent uh, and it will pass away. Uh. You know, when we enjoy uh, life, uh, time goes by very fast. Uh. But when we suffer, uh, time goes by very slowly. If a uh, being in heaven, uh, after a lifetime of millions of years, uh, that lifetime ends, uh, he will think, uh, oh, my life is so short. <laughs> Still got this to do, that to do. Uh. But a being in hell, uh, when he's suffering, uh, one day to go by uh, is like eternity. 
because during that one day uh, he's tortured uh, so much, uh, he suffers so much. Uh. So devas, uh, they, they think uh, the path to happiness uh, is to do deeds of merit. But the Buddha, uh, in is the second sutta, uh, where he says uh, that we should drop the world's bait. Don't be tempted by all the pleasures in the world, uh, because if you want to enjoy the pleasures in the world, uh, you can never get out of the world. And this world uh, is unsatisfactory. Uh, the fifth sutta, at Savati, Standing to one side, that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. How many must one cut? How many abandon? And how many further must one develop? When the bhikkhu has surmounted, how many times is he called a crosser of the flood? And the Buddha said, one must cut off five, abandon five, and must develop a further five. A bhikkhu who has surmounted five ties, is called a crosser of the flood. So here the deva is asking, uh, how many things must one cut? How many things must one abandon? And how many things further must one develop? Uh, uh, can you cross the flood? Uh? And the Buddha says, uh, this one, uh, we have to refer to the later books. Uh, and this is the explanation. Uh, one must cut off five lower fetters. Uh, and then one must abandon five five other things la. and when one must develop la, the five faculties la. and then uh, you must surmount five other ties. La. Now what are these things? La? The five lower factors la, that you have to cut off la, to be liberated. La. One is the identity view, la. Sakaya Diti. That means you identify yourself as somebody. La. And another of the lower factors is doubt. Na. And then the third is attachment to rules and rituals, sila bhakta paramasa. And the fourth is sensual desire. And the fifth is ill will. If a person cuts off these five lower factors, na, this one that I just mentioned, identity, view, doubt, attachment to rules and rituals, sensual desire and ill will, na, he becomes an anagamin. Na. An anagamin, the third fruit, Arya has abandoned the five lower factors. Mm. And then the Buddha said, I must abandon five other things. La. Abandon lust for form, lust for the formless world, conceit, restlessness and ignorance. These are the remaining factors. La. There are ten factors la, that we have to eliminate la, to become liberated. La. So the first five are the five lower factors and the next five are the five higher factors. La. And then, to, to, to achieve that, uh, you have to develop the five faculties. Uh. These five faculties, uh, which are very helpful uh, to enlightenment. Uh. The first one is faith, faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And then energetic effort, uh. effort, uh, in making effort. Uh. Then recollection, uh, sati. Then concentration, samadhi. And wisdom, panya. Mm. These are the five faculties uh, that we have to develop uh, to attain liberation or enlightenment. And then the five ties uh, that we have to surmount uh, is lust, hatred, delusion, conceit and views. La. Five ties, the five sangha, uh, S-A-N-G-A. So these are the things uh, that we have to abandon and uh, eliminate, develop, etc. to become liberated. The six sutta, 1.6, uh, Esavati, standing to one side that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. How many are asleep and others are awake? How many are awake and others asleep? By how many does one gather dust? By how many is one purified? And the Buddha said, five are asleep when others are awake. Five are awake when others asleep. By five things one gathers dust. By five things, one is purified. So here, what does, what does the Buddha mean? Eh? Five are asleep when others are awake, eh? and five are awake when others are asleep. Eh? These refer to the five hindrances eh, and the five faculties. Eh? When your five faculties are asleep, eh, then your five hindrances are awake. Eh? But when your five faculties are awake, eh, then your five hindrances are asleep. Eh? They are like kind of opposite to each other. Uh, 
they are opposed to each other. And then, one gathers dust, uh, means the dust of defilements, uh, by five things. Uh, the five hindrances uh, make us have this uh, dust of defilements. Uh, and five things make us purified, uh, are the five faculties. Uh, just now I mentioned the five faculties. Uh, faith, energy, recollection, concentration and wisdom uh, makes one purified. Uh, the seventh sutta at Savati, standing to one side that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Those who have not penetrated things, who may be led into others' doctrines, pass asleep, they have not yet awakened. It is time for them to awaken. And the Buddha said, those who have penetrated things well, who cannot be led into others' doctrines, those awakened ones, having rightly known, fare evenly amidst the uneven. When the Buddha says, uh, those who have penetrated things well, uh, who cannot be led into others' doctrines, uh, the Buddha refers to the Aryans, uh, the eight, eight Aryans, uh, the four paths and the four fruitions, uh, and the awakened ones, uh, or the fully awakened ones, uh, are the, the Buddhas and the Arahant disciples. Uh, but uh, you can include the Aryans also, uh, because all, they are on their way to out of uh, samsara. The eight sutta at Savati, standing to one side that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Those who are utterly muddled about things, who may be led into others' doctrines, fast asleep, they have not yet awakened. It is time for them to awaken. And the Buddha said, those who aren't muddled about things, who cannot be led into others' doctrines, those awakened ones, having rightly known, fare evenly amidst the uneven. So the Deva is talking about ordinary beings, Putu eh? Jhanas, and the Buddha is talking about Aryans. The Nine Sutta at Savati, standing to one side, that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. There is no taming here for one fond of conceit, nor is there sagehood for the unconcentrated. Though dwelling alone in the forest, heedless, one cannot cross beyond the realm of death. And the Buddha said, Having abandoned conceit, well concentrated, with lofty mind, everywhere released, while dwelling alone in the forest, diligent, one can cross beyond the realm of death. These devas, huh, because they are in the forest, huh, sometimes they see huh, monks, huh, coming into the forest to practice. Lah. Sometimes they come alone. But some of them, uh, like here, the, the Deva says, uh, the fond of conceit still has uh, the ego. Uh, so one has, uh, cannot let go of the ego. Uh, one cannot cross beyond the realm of death. Lah. And then also one who is unconcentrated. Uh, so the, the Deva says, uh, though dwelling alone in the forest, heedless, one cannot cross beyond the realm of death. Sometimes certain monks, uh, they go and live alone in the forest, uh, but they are not using effort, uh, or not using effort in the right way, uh, even though they seem to dwell alone, uh, but they cannot uh, attain liberation. But the Buddha says, uh, if a person abandons conceit uh, and cultivates concentration, uh, then uh, dwelling in the forest alone uh, and diligent, uh, diligent is very important, then only you can cross the realm of death. Ten Sutta at Savati, standing to one side that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Those who dwell deep in the forest, peaceful, leading the holy life, eating but a single meal a day, why is their complexion so serene? And the Blessed One said, they do not sorrow over the past, nor do they hanker for the future. They maintain themselves with what is present, hence their complexion is so serene. Through hankering for the future, through soaring over the past, fools dry up and wither away like a green reed cut down. So here the Deva, he sees uh, monks uh, who dwell alone in the forest uh, and eat one meal a day uh, and leading a very hard life. Uh, and yet, uh, they look so peaceful, so contented, and he asked why. And the Buddha said, because they do not sorrow over the past. You know, many of us, we think of the past and we have remorse. 
we have regret. Na. We keep thinking of the past, many people. Na. For example, if a person, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, relationships break up, na, and then they keep thinking of the past, na, and they become so miserable, and sometimes they commit suicide. Na. But, uh, so um, uh, among practicing the right way, na, you do not sorrow over the past, and you, you do not hanker for the future, you don't worry about the future. La. Uh, those who are ambitious uh, uh, will think about the future. La. And the Buddha said, uh, they maintain themselves with what is present, hence their complexion is so serene. So, a person who practices the holy path, uh, he's always mindful of his object of meditation. He also always has to bring his mind uh, back to his object. Uh, in other words, he has to remember to contemplate uh, his object of meditation. That's why the word sati uh, is called recollection, remembering uh, uh, your object of meditation. Uh, so it is not sati, is not general mindfulness, but always remembering to bring your mind back to your object of meditation. Uh, so if a person constantly uh, has sati, uh, bringing back his mind uh, to his meditation object, uh, then his mind is in the present. Uh, he does not think of the past, he does not think of the future. Uh, when you think of the past, you have sorrow, you have remorse. Uh, when you think of the future, you have a lot of worries. Uh, so without thinking of, of these two extremes, uh, you are mindful of the here and now, uh, then you'll be happy. Uh. Now we come to the second section, uh, the 11th Sutta in the whole Sangyutta. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Bhikkhus, I stop here for a while. This Blessed One uh, normally is a translation for the word Bhagawa. Bhagawa, or sometimes Bhagawan, uh, in certain books, uh, is a term of respect uh, for a holy man uh, called Bhagawa. And this word Bhikkhu, uh, Bhikkhu is a term uh, for Buddhist monks. Uh, and it was coined by the Buddha. It comes from the word big. Nah. Big is the, uh, became the English word beg. Nah. So, bhikkhu means a beggar. Nah. So that's why a, a, a lay person should never call a monk bhikkhu. Nah. Uh, only the Buddha is qualified nah, to call a monk bhikkhu. Nah. Nah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to discipline the monks, nah, put down their ego, nah, to remember that they are beggars. Nah. So lay people during the Buddha's time always refer to the monks as Bhante. La. And then we see in the suttas that even the monks uh, call the Buddha Bhante, uh, which means reverend or reverend sir. La. So here the Buddha addressed the monks, bhikkhus. La. Sometimes it's translated as monks. La. And the monks replied, Venerable Sir or Bhante, la. Bhante or Badanta. The Blessed One said, once in the past, bhikkhus, or monks, a certain devata of the Tavatimsa host was reveling in the Nandana grove, supplied and endowed with the five chords of celestial sensual pleasure, accompanied by a retinue of celestial nymphs. On that occasion, he spoke this verse, They do not know bliss who have not seen Nandana, the abode of the glorious male devas belonging to the host of thirty. When this was said, monks, a certain devata replied to that devata in verse, Don't you know, you fool, that maxim or the saying of the arahants, impermanent are all formations, their nature is to arise and vanish. Having arisen, they cease, their appeasement is blissful. This chan, sometimes we chan, anicca vata sankara upada vaya damino upaditava nirujanti te sangupa samo sukho. This especially, this chant is used uh, in a funeral uh, when somebody passes away. Uh. Mm. So this Tavatimsa heaven uh, is the heaven of the 30 or 33 uh, because there are 30 or uh, sometimes they mention 30, sometimes they mention 33. The Deva Rajas there, uh, number 30. Uh. It's like our sultan, there are leaders, there are 30 or 33 of them. That's why it's called Tawatimsa heaven. Mm. And in this heaven, there is a very beautiful garden called the Nandana Grove. When you are reborn in that heaven, you enjoy all kinds of heavenly pleasures in that, in that Nandana Grove. So this Deva says, anybody who has not seen Nandana Grove, they don't know what happiness is. 
But this is the other um, Reva, he's martyr. So he said, don't you know what the Arahan say? Then he quoted this, impermanent are all formations. All the things in the world are impermanent. The nature is to arise and vanish. Having a reason, they cease. The appeasement is blissful. The appeasement means uh, the, the, the seizing of all formations, uh, the seizing of all things in the world. Uh, is real peace, uh, because that peace uh, is permanent peace. Uh. 1.12 uh, At Savati, standing to one side, that Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. One who has sons delights in sons. One with cattle delights in cattle. Acquisitions truly are a man's delight. Without acquisitions, one does not delight. And the Buddha said, One who has sons sorrows over sons. One with cattle sorrows over cattle. Acquisitions truly are a man's sorrows. Without acquisitions, one does not sorrow. So here you see, yeah, the Deva is saying yeah, that when you have property, yeah, you have sons and you have property, yeah, then you are a happy man. But the Buddha says the opposite. Yeah. One who has sons sorrows over sons. And this one uh, just reminds me, uh, the other day, one of our, our Samanera here came to ordain. Uh, he brought the brother along. The brother was in a hurry to go back. <laughs> then asked why. I said, because the son uh, has become a drug addict. So got caught by police. Uh, so you see, uh, one who has sons uh, sorrows over sons. <laughs> Especially nowadays. Uh, uh, one who has daughters also sorrows over daughters. Uh, sometimes the daughter runs away from home. <laughs> then you have uh, cattle, you have to worry about your cattle. You have property, you have to worry about your property. Uh, so, if a person does not have anything, uh, has nothing to worry about. Uh, actually, we came into this world empty-handed, with nothing. We are going to go off empty-handed. So why do you want to have so much things? <laughs> we do our duty, uh, whatever our duty is. Uh, and then if we get... Okay, we don't get also okay, I leave everything to our karma. No? The 13th Sutta at Savati, standing to one side that Devata spoke this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. There is no affection like that for a son, no wealth equal to cattle, there is no light like the sun. Among the waters, the ocean is supreme. And the Buddha said, there is no affection like that for oneself, no wealth equal to grain, there is no light like wisdom. Among the waters, the rain is supreme. So you see, eh, the Buddha, the, the, the Deva says, eh, there is no love eh, like that for a son. But the Buddha says, eh, there is no love eh, like that for oneself. Because eh, even though whatever we like or whatever we love, eh, the love for oneself eh, is the greatest. Because of our ego, eh, we love ourselves the most. If you say you love somebody uh, more than yourself, uh, you are hypocritical. <laughs> and then he says, uh, there is no wealth equal to cattle, but the Buddha says there is no wealth equal to grain. Maybe because uh, grain, uh, you can, I, I'm not sure why, uh, you, can, you can grow, you can sell, you can fill your stomach, everything. There is no light like wisdom. Uh. The Deva says there is no light like the sun. Uh. The sun is so bright, but the Buddha says there is no light like wisdom. Because... People like the Buddha, when they are enlightened, uh, their light uh, shine forth from their head. Uh, and this light uh, can illuminate uh, many, many world systems. Uh, but ordinary beings cannot see. Uh. And then among the waters, the rain is supreme. Uh, when the rain comes, uh, it gives life. Uh. Actually, in the Sutta, uh, the Buddha says, uh, uh, life depends on water. See? Only now, uh, scientists know uh, that actually, uh, like they go to, they send a uh, spacecraft to Mars and anywhere. Eh? They want to look for water. If there's any source of water, eh, then they know eh, that at one time there was life. Eh? Uh, so the Buddha, eh, so long ago, eh, 2,500 years, 2, years ago, the Buddha already knew that. Now only scientists know. The 14th Sutta. The Katya or warrior is the best of bipeds, two-legged beings. Eh? The ox, the best of quadrupeds. A maiden is the best of wives, the firstborn the best of sons. And the Buddha said, The Buddha is the best of bipeds, a steed the best of quadrupeds. An obedient woman is the best of wives, a dutiful son the best of sons. Uh, here, 
this deva, says uh, the noble caste or the warrior is the best of two-footed beings. Uh, but the Buddha says uh, the best of two-footed beings uh, is the Buddha, the awakened one, the enlightened one. And then the deva says the ox uh, is the best of four-footed beings. Uh, the Buddha says uh, the steed, uh, the good horse, uh, is the best of quadrupeds. Uh, and then um, the deva says a maiden is the best of wives. In other words, a young wife. Nah. But the Buddha says, an uh, obedient woman is the best of wives. Uh, and then the Deva says, the firstborn is the best of sons. But the Buddha says, uh, a dutiful boy or obedient son uh, is the best of sons. Uh. Some people, uh, they have many children, uh, but when they are old, uh, not one of the children wants to look after them. But you have a good son or a good daughter, uh, one is enough uh, when you grow old. Uh that obedient son or daughter will look after you. The 15th Sutta. When the noon hour sets in and the birds have settled down, the forest, the mighty forest itself murmurs. How fearful that appears to me, the Deva said. And the Buddha said, when the noon hour sets in and the birds have settled down, the mighty forest itself murmurs. How delightful that appears to me. So here, the Deva is saying uh, in the Noon, around noon time, all the birds uh, have quietened down uh, and the forest is so quiet and still, uh, he finds that fearful. But the Buddha says, uh, at that time, uh, the Buddha finds it so delightful uh, because he's so peaceful, uh, nobody to disturb his meditation, his bliss, his peace. 1.16, the Deva said, drowsiness, lethargy, lazy stretching, discontent, torpor after meals, because of this, here among beings, the noble path does not appear. And the Buddha said, drowsiness, lethargy, lazy stretching, discontent, torpor after meals. When one dispels this with energy, the noble path is cleared. So here the Deva must have seen some monks, huh, after eating a lot, huh, they are very drowsy. The mind is lethargic, huh, lazy, huh, not inclined to motion. Huh, and Topper, sloth and topper after meals. La. So because of that, now eating too much, uh, uh, this uh, monk uh, does not see the noble path. La. But the Buddha says, uh, if the monk is energetic, uh, puts in a lot of effort, uh, then uh, all the drowsiness, lethargy, topper, etc. will clear away. La. And then he sees the noble path clearly. La. 17 Sutta. The ascetic life is hard to practice and hard for the inept or in unskillful uh, to endure. How many are the obstructions there in which the fool found us? How many days can one practice the ascetic life if one does not rein in one's mind? One would founder with each step under control of one's intentions. And I think the Buddha replied, uh, drawing in the mind's thoughts as a tortoise draws into draws its limbs into its shell, independent, not harassing others, fully quenched. A bhikkhu would not blame anyone. So the deva is saying uh, that a, a monk who is unskillful uh, will find uh, the ascetic, ascetic life, uh, the holy life, uh, very hard to practice. Uh, and there are many obstructions for him, uh, uh, for him to founder, means to fail, uh, to fall down. Uh. The Buddha says, uh, the, the monk uh, should draw in the thoughts, uh, just like a tortoise uh, draws his limbs into his shell, uh, and then uh, he can be fully quenched. Uh. The 18th Sutta, the Deva says, uh, Is there a person somewhere in the world who is restrained by a sense of shame, one who draws back from blame, as a good horse does from the whip? And the Buddha says, Few are those restrained by a sense of shame, who fare always mindful. Few, having reached the end of suffering, fare evenly amidst the uneven. The Deva is asking uh, whether there is someone uh, who has a sense of shame. Uh, and the Buddha says uh, very few, uh, very few who are collected. And then the 19th Sutta, uh, the Deva says, Don't you have a little hut? Don't you have a little nest? Don't you have any lines extended? Are you free from bondage? 
And the Buddha says, Surely I have no little hut. Surely I have no little nest. Surely I have no lines extended. Surely I'm free from bondage. And the Deva asks, What do you think I call a little hut? What do you think I call a little nest? What do you think I call lines extended? What do you think I call bondage? And the Buddha replied, It's a mother that you call a little hut. A wife that you call a little nest. Sons you call lines extended. Craving that you tell me is bondage. And the Deva said, It's good that you have no little hut. Good that you have no little nest. Good that you have no lines extended. Good that you are free from bondage. So here, the Deva is asking a riddle, uh, asking the Buddha whether he has a hut, a nest, uh, lines extended. Uh, uh, and then the Buddha says he has none of these. Uh. Then the Deva tests him, uh, to test him, uh, asks him, uh, do you know what, what I mean when I say a little hut, a nest, and the lines extended? And the Buddha says, uh, yes. Uh. The Buddha says, a hut refers to the mother. Uh. Once a person renounces, uh, he's supposed to renounce a family, so he has no mother, no father, doesn't have a wife, the nest, uh, and doesn't have children, uh, lines extended, uh, and the Deva praised him. Now we come to the 20th Sutta. That is a bit long, so maybe tonight I stop here. You don't have any question? You don't have any question? You don't have any You see here uh, in this Sangita, all the suttas uh, have to do with experiences of the Buddha with these uh, devas. Uh. Later, maybe you will come across some other suttas uh, in the same Sangita where other monks also has, have experience uh, with these devas. Uh. And the experience is stated here. I think normally when they say when the night is advanced, uh, means the middle watch, uh, which is between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Uh. Usually, uh, devas in the heavenly realm, uh, they're enjoying themselves so much uh, that they don't, think, they don't think so much of making merit. Uh. But there are some uh, who may have known the Dhamma in the previous life, uh, then uh, they would want to do merit. Uh, for example, Sakadeva Raja, it seems, uh, he liked to make offerings to the Arahan uh, Maha Kasapa. Uh, Maha Kasapa is a very, was a very ascetic monk. Uh. So, if you, being an Arahan, uh, if you give uh, food to him, uh, it's very meritorious. Uh. So, you have later books like the Dhammapada commentary, uh, where they they may have made up some stories la, about this uh, Sakadeva Raja always trying to make offering to the, this Arahans, la, especially like Mahakasapa. Yeah. <laughs> Very probably true. Because in the book, you see that you become a person in the forest, but you say that the problem is in the book, I think the forest out of nowhere, the person comes, they are dead, they walk, they come back. Yeah, because these devas and also ghosts, they are psychic. If they don't want us to see them, we don't see them. But when they want us to see them, then they will appear for us to see. You see, for a monk uh, to go into the deep forest, uh, it's a rare sight, you see. So these devas uh, will all notice. Uh, they will immediately uh, can gauge his mind, uh, they can read his mind. Uh, so they will know immediately what type of person this is. Uh. Because of that, uh, they will be protective. Uh. They know uh, that is a, is a good person, a uh, very sincere cultivator. I mean, I experienced also, uh, because I stayed in this cave in Penang Hill uh, for seven years. Uh, so I'm sure there are devas around. Uh. One day a man came uh, and he had, I think had been practicing uh, Taoism. Uh, so, you know, some people, they practice Taoism, they have some spirit inside of them. 
So when he came into this cave, uh, immediately, uh, like somebody strangled him, he could not breathe. He could not breathe. And he had to sit down. He had to sit down and, and after a while he felt better. So maybe the Deva thought uh, this was a bit of a threat. Uh, give him a warning. <laughs> uh, so these things happen. Any other thing? Okay, not the transfer merit. Mm.